Hi there, I'm Steve Lee and I'm going to be talking to you about uh, cognitive accessibility at the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative, or WAY. Uh, my email address, should you be interested, is stevelee at w3.org. Okay, so we're going to talk about accessibility for people with cognitive and learning disabilities. And um, what you'll hopefully go away with at the end of this uh, presentation is a guide to understanding and implementing cognitive accessibility and also um, information about the, the Way Accessibility Initiative website. So what's the problem we're trying to address with this talk? Well, first of all, I'm assuming you want to know um, the cognitive accessibility barriers that people may have and experience in their lives. You want to, uh, or you need to uh, avoid and remove these barriers. And you also like to have a comprehensive guide to accessibility that includes cognitive accessibility. So there's an emerging awareness at the moment about cognitive accessibility. And, and part of that is, I think, is, is due to a more general understanding um, or knowledge of neurodiversity and also mental health and how they interact with digital technology. Some people actually treat cognitive accessibility as their identity. This is particularly popular in certain groups within the autistic community, whereby they identify as autistic. Traditionally in accessibility, we've tried not to label people. So we say people um, have low vision, not they are blind. But however, some people in the autistic um, community wear it as a badge of pride and it identifies who they are. And increasing, there's an increasing use of technology in everyday activities. Obviously, this affects anybody um, with or without accessibilities. But because it really is impacting so much more, we're finding that people with cognitive accessibilities are, are experiencing more problems. And of course, long COVID, I had to get the pandemic in there somewhere, didn't I? That's um, things like brain fog and extreme fatigue, which are similar to uh, ME in, in many ways. Um, they also impact people's um, cognitive abilities when using technical equipment. So neurodiversity, I'm sort of assuming you know what it means. It's, it's basically a, an idea or thought that we are all different in terms of our the way we think and, and do things. If you think about it, it's not too surprising. The, the brain is a, a massively complicated organ. It's incredible, wonderful even. But um, not only is it dependent on um, what we're born with, our genetics, our code, but also every bit of our life affects the way we, we think and our behaviours. So it's not at all surprising that everybody who's using digital equipment comes to it with a different set of behaviours, different requirements. If we think about the sort of problems that people, uh, not problems, the, the sort of areas where people may experience such issues, there could be situational uh, problems. Uh, for example, yeah, I often find if I'm on a ticket machine trying to get a ticket out of it and it doesn't quite make sense and then there's a great big queue of impatient people behind me, I get stressed and get all over the place. Uh, it could be short term and that might be something like um, if you've uh, taken some medication which affects the, your thinking. It could be uh, uh, something like a short um, concussion. Alternatively, um, there are long term uh, effects that people have. For example, dementia, you get repeats you in a certain time of life, um, unfortunately it doesn't usually get better. It could be brain fog due to um, the menopause, for example. And there's also permanent uh, cognitive disabilities arise through um, the congenital things that people have like learning disabilities. The sort of thing that the, the basic skills then that cognitive accessibility, uh, sorry, co cognitive disabilities impact are how easily you can learn new things, how you communicate. Some people um, are non-communicative and or may use symbols rather than words. Uh, your reading, writing and maths, so just basic skills there. At a sort of, sort of slightly higher cognitive level, then it may affect your ability to remember things, uh, your ability to pay attention. Visual processing is an interesting one. You think about it, um, vision, it's very little to do with your eyeballs and more, more, uh, more to do with the brain and cognition. And things like dyslexia um, are usually are an example of, of that sort of issue. Um, the ability to, to 
to handle language and to numerical thinking. And by numerical thinking, I mean um, things like handling big numbers or little numbers where language like larger and smaller might be more easy. And, and then really sort of um, overall, this, this impacts um, people, people's ability to um, process information, acquire new skills, and, and, and all of that ends up uh, reducing their independence, especially if they can't use technology without support because of the cognitive barriers. So there are a few gaps um, between um, existing accessibility provision and there's also some overlaps with some other areas, so I just want to quickly cover those. So some of the user needs that people have when they have a cognitive disability are not currently directly addressed by the accessibility standards. Some of the accessibility standards tests, um, which we'll come back to briefly later, um, it's not clear how with cognitive accessibility some of these things can be tested. For example, what is easy to read? How do, how do you define that? Um, in terms of other areas where th that are starting to address cognitive accessibility, things like information architecture and navigation, how you move around a site, how you find things, um, they, they look at areas which are important for cognitive uh, accessibility. Um, also user experience, experience or content design. And content design is quite a new, um, I can't quite think of the right word, a, a new discipline if you like. Um, but the GDS um, with the government website really sort of started to think about this and, and it's become a, a lot more attention has come to this. And some of the areas I'll mention later are very, fall very much in, in content design. There's also personalization. As I said, everyone's brain's different, which means the way you interact with technology is going to, what well, you're going to prefer certain ways that the next person will not. Um, there is some personalization. Trivially, it's where we have a dark mode, which is really popular now. But there's a lot more. Browsers are starting to have a reading mode, which strips out all the images and communication. You can just read the text. Um, this is an area which I think we're going to see a lot more uh, work in. In fact, at the, um, the, the WTC have, have a task force looking at personalization, and that spun out from the cognitive work because it became clear it's a big topic on its own. So, W3C way, who are they, what are they? Well, uh, on, on the website we say, we develop standards and support materials to help you understand and implement accessibility. That then is our mission statement, I guess. What in particular do we have at the, um, in way? which is the, the uh, abbreviation for Web, web Accessibility Initiative. What, what, if, what do we have for cognitive accessibility? Well, first of all, it's, um, it's worth saying who are the W3C. Um, and Tim Berners-Lee set the W3C up right, right in the early days of the web, after he'd sort of launched his first website, which still works on the website, on the web. Um, to make sure that big corporates didn't own the web, also to make other people didn't sort of start badly impacting it, um, so it didn't reach its full potential. That might be over-enthusiastic web de um, browser developers, or even unenthusiastic web, web browser developers. <laughs> um, so we, in the way, we, we deal more with the web for all part of it. Um, and making sure everyone can use the web. And that goes hand in hand with internationalization, of course, to make sure anyone with any language can also use the web. Um, a large part of the W3C and the way work is, is creating standards, and they're, they're open standards, and that means that if everybody, agree, they're, they're a lingua franca, that if everybody works to them, then everything works together. And, and the web is something really amazing in terms of the way it works on so many devices and so many websites and across so many technologies. The Accessibility Guidelines Working Group then is one, one, one group within the W3C who work mainly on the web contents accessibility guidelines, which you may well have heard, heard about. Um, they did do other work as well. In working on the web content accessibility guidelines, they often have to spin off task groups to focus on particular areas, sorry, task forces. And the Cognitive Learning and Disability Task Force is one of those and I guess you can guess what they work on. Um, all the W3C work is in the open. It uses public mailing lists, GitHub, all, ministers, mini, uh, sorry, all meetings are minuted. And we, um, and we work in the 
on GitHub more often than not as well. Um, for example, the, the contents of the Way website is all, all on GitHub. Um, in terms of who works at the WTC and, and also therefore the Way, there, there are the representatives of various membership organisations. There's a team which is fairly small and we act more in an advisory role as glue and, and oil to keep things um, moving and, and together, the sound like opposites. Um, they're also invited experts, and they're not necessarily technical experts, they may be users, and in the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force, certainly um, some of the invited people are, are users. And, and also public, everything is, goes out for public review um, before it's finalised. And there are other ways that people can get involved. So, Cognitive accessibility at away. Well, the majority of the WCAG accessibility criteria, and I probably ought to unpack that. WCAG is a technical document that describes how to make something accessible. And it's broken down into a number of success criteria, which basically describe what you need to do at a fairly technical level. And they're also testable. Um, the, the WCAG guidelines get used in policy as well, so people can say that a website is conformant or not to some sort of accessibility standard. Um, so a majority of the success criteria, although they weren't written specifically for cognitive accessibility, they cover it. Also there's a new version, the WCAG 2.2 draft, which is on its way, includes some new success criteria specifically uh, introduced from, from requirements that surface through the work of the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force. The, an obvious one is accessible, accessible logging, which is such an important thing. The sort of cognitive issues that people have there, you know, remembering passwords or getting confused. The Cognitive Task Force performed a quite a bit of user research examining what people's user requirements were. And then after doing that, and, um, they did a gap analysis on what is technology support at the moment for these requirements and, and what are the problems that need resolving. From that, and it took a quite a few years, they've created the web, making web content usable for people with cognitive and learning disabilities. And this is a document. Part of that um, is the design guide and, and a web version of that is coming out soon as well. So here's the uh, URL for this document. I'll, I'll just read it out. Um, it's w3.org slash capital T, capital R, COGA, that's C-O-G-A, hyphen, usable. And um, what is it? Well, it's a w W3C technical note, and, and that, to W3C, is something very specific. It's normally what standards are. So if you look at the CSSS standards, um, they, they use this format, which means it's a very technical format. It's got some specific requirements about, in terms of the template, the things that are in there. Um, but even though it uses the uh, technical standard format, the uh, content usable, as I call it now, is actually a supplemental guidance to work out. And that means it's not required, it's informative, it's useful information. Um, it's made up of three main sections, the user requirements to make sure we know what people require. This comes, filters through from the user research that was done before. Some personas, which um, you may or may not know, a fairly common design uh, tool, if you like. Uh, but basically the idea is to create a sort of vignette of a person, an imaginary person, uh, so that you can start to understand what their needs as a user might be, the sort of things they want, uh, the behaviours they have. Um, and all then it includes the design guide. It also includes a number of appendices. Perhaps the most important is the one that maps between the needs, the personas, and the patterns that are in the, in the design guide. So what is the design guide section? Well, it's primarily for designers and developers. What it consists of is a number of patterns. In fact, there's about 50 of them. It shows you how much, um, how much information there is in order to meet uh, cognitive accessibility. And those patterns provide a practical approach, steps you can perform to meet, uh, to improve uh, cognitive accessibility. The patterns themselves are grouped into objects because there are so many of them. And, and the objectives are actually themes, really, if you like. And each one gives you a nice high level view of a certain area of cognitive accessibility and the rate of those, which is much more manageable. So each pattern itself, contains a user need to make sure we're anchored in, in user requirements. 
a section on what to do to improve the accessibility, another section which breaks down how it helps, and that can be useful if there are area, uh, you meet situations which aren't specifically covered in the what to do, I help you to understand why the, um, why the pattern exists and hopefully you can um, figure out how to better meet the needs. And finally, there's some examples um, of what to do and what to avoid doing. So let me run through these objectives. As I said, they act as a summary of, of the areas of, of cognitive accessibility that are, are worth thinking about at, at any level. The first is to help users understand what things are and how to use them. Now, a good, good way to do this is to use common website themes and patterns and idioms that you've seen before. If someone recognises a website um, and they've used something like it before, then that's fine. If you've done a crazy, uh, you know, um, interactive, animated site, then that's going to be more difficult for people. Another thing is help users find what they need. And that, and that really um, implies um, impacts on your navigation, both for the site and, and how things are organized on the page. If people, uh, people may well have uh, difficulties finding things. Um, use clear content. And this is probably the biggest section and, it, and it, where it overlaps with content um, design. It's all about the text, the images, and the media, how to make sure that they are as accessible as possible. And um, help users avoid making state mistakes. This is particularly important in forms. Um, do, you, do you make the form as easy to use as possible? Are you not making assumptions? Can, for example, if you type in a phone number, does it allow you to have spaces or not? Same with credit card numbers. Because people can get in a, a bit of a tailspin if they type in their phone number as they use it and they get an error. Help users focus. Now this is surprisingly, a, a, a large number of people really want to focus on the task in hand. They don't want to get interrupted. And one of the easiest ways, for example, that you can help people do this is that you can give them a list of all the information they need before they start filling in your form. Otherwise, you go through the form and you have to go off, stop working on it, go and find your passport, which is under the bed, and then you've forgotten where you are. And ensure processes do not use memory. I've already hinted at one of those, accessible authentication. Do they need to remember a password? Or do you allow a, um, a password manager to be used? Um, another one is provide help and support. And that's not just the help, um, a fact, which often aren't much help, <laughs> or an email address that isn't responded to. When people have problems, what they often want is a person to speak to, and then they can very quickly sort out what their problems is. So human help is one of the things that is often makes a big difference. Obviously, not all websites can do that, especially if it's in maintenance mode, being archived. Um, and support, adaptation, and personalization. I've already touched on this a bit, but in terms, as well as allowing people to personalize their experience, you can support APIs which allow assistive technologies to work with the web content. Um, so let's have a quick peek at these documents. I'm going to make it very, very quick. So here's the document. As I said, if you've ever seen a W3 st uh, standard, you'll recognize this. It is a very long document because of all the sections in there. I just wanted you to see um, how much is in there. So we jump to the design guide, but only because it's not because it's more important, but because it's the bit I like the most, that I've worked on the most. As you can see, there's an introduction and then the various objectives. Um, quite a bit of text. I'm, I'm not going to go into any detail. If you want to look at it, the URL is there. We've also started to work on the web version of this. Um, and I, I'm going to give you a sneak peek, a very, very early preview. Um, this is what one of those patterns could look like. The, there's a project in the W3C at the moment to work on a number of documentation sets which support WCAG. Uh, these include supplementary guidance techniques, and there's also some uh, a new accessibility conformance testing package. And the idea is that, that these will have a common look and feel because they all support uh, are related um, and have similar large chunks of collections of information. So e e the idea here is that each pattern has its own page of those. Um, exactly the same sections you saw in the document. There's a little pager so you can go up a level or, or to the next pattern or back. 
And, and there's a sidebar which has links actually back to the document I showed you, um, especially a glossary, which I should have mentioned. One of the parts of the, um, the document is a glossary of terms in cognitive accessibility. And um, you can jump to the user story that this pattern um, help, tries to address and then to the various personas for this pattern. So hopefully this will be more useful for a certain group of people, designers and developers who want to know what to do for a particular thing. Whereas the TR note is, for, is often useful for a different group of people um, who want a large document. So let's go back. The Way website. Now the reason I'm talking to you about this is not a lot of people know about it actually. And, and if you do want a resource for accessibility uh, from any level, for any topic, there's a wealth of information here that's been put together. Um, the way we de it describes itself is strategy, strategies, standards, supporting resources to help you make the web more accessible to people with disabilities. There's an awful lot of content in here, so there's quite a um, quite a, a big navigation. So just to give you an idea of the sort of content that's on there, um, there are introductions to various topics, including accessibility itself. Uh, there are guides on, on various topics, um, like for older accessibility for older people, say. There are in-depth articles, in, in, um, including some guidelines to how to make things um, key controls accessible. And there are links to key resources, like the, work, um, the content accessibility guidelines and, and this new document that I've just shown you. A, a suggested starting point, um, I've put a URL here, it's a good place to get going, is w3.org slash W-A-I, that's all capitals, slash fundamentals, slash accessibility hyphen intro. Um, in terms of the sections, it's organized in terms so that very people who have various interests or roles can easily find the information that's relevant to them. So for example, there's an accessibility fun fundamental section, great place to start if you're new to accessibility and want to get an overview of it. There's a section for people involved in planning and policies it tends to be a high level, level overview. Um, there's the section for designers and developers, that's a lot more technical, and test and evaluation, and that includes conformance testing. And teach an advocate, which is you know, an important thing. Some people aren't fully aware about accessibility and how it can improve their reach with their uh, digital artifacts. And finally, there's the standards and guidelines section, which is basically all the detailed nitty gritty uh, which the other sections eventually point to. Um, so here's some example resources that you can find. I haven't given the URLs because they just clutter the screen up really, but there's a, a section on how people with disabilities use the web. And I, I recommend anyone read that because it's quite an eye opener and you get to understand how people may be trying to use your website and possibly give you some insight into the barriers that they may have due to design decisions or, or coding decisions that have been made. There's also the Digital Accessibility Foundations. This is a free online course which we've created, again on, on, on at the more introductory level. The way of actually creating a curricula, that the idea is to standardise the way people teach accessibility. And another section is Easy Checks, which is a, a, a collection of easy things, low hanging fruit if you like, that you can run over your, your website to, to make easy accessibility wins. And then of course there's the web content accessibility guidelines themselves and the supporting information for them. That's a big technical document but um, that underlies not only the technical requirements but also a lot of policy uh, from different countries now refer back to that. So we've had a look at assistive uh, cognitive accessibility and the way websites. I hope you found that useful. It's quite a bit of content there. Um, just if you want to have some actions to do afterwards, I, I recommend that you first of all go to the Way website cognitive section to look at the, to get an introduction to all the cognitive resources that we've got. You can read the content usable note itself and when it's released you'll be able to look at the design guide in, in, in the Way website. You can explore the Way website to see the uh, plethora of resources that are there. And if you want to engage with us, there are multiple ways of doing it at various levels. Um, we'd love to have you working, uh, talking to us. And on the website, there's a participating section. Thank you very much.